Good afternoon. We'd like to start, please. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Christina Hauskeller. I'm professor in the philosophy department. My co-host today is Professor Celia Morgan from the psychology department. We both have research groups working on psychedelics and we've put them together a year ago, starting this colloquium across our, both our disciplines and have a high profile guest here today. Thank you to the psychology department for supporting us with actually holding this event and several other ones to come in the weeks ahead. We have to just say a little bit about the programs we do. So we started about three years ago, working on philosophy and psychedelics in philosophy and had a conference last April. We have a book coming out next month and that will be launched at a postgraduate conference we have here at the end of June from the 28th to the 30th with several high profile keynote speakers, but also students from Exeter and postgraduate researchers, people from our MA program giving presentations. Um, and yeah, so we have the book. We also teach a master's module in philosophy and psychedelics within our philosophy MA. And Celia does her work, which I'd like her to introduce. There we go. And let introduce the table for her. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we're working on psychedelics as well, and as actually a number of the postdocs and PhD students who are here who are contributing to the conference in June, so that's the 28th to the 30th, so great, especially if early career researchers want to come along, and we have a evening in the bootlegger bar, is it, <laughs> Christine, with DJs as well as part of that, so well, I'll get on with introducing Dave, um, he really needs no introduction, I think, um, I'm sure you all know who he is, and that's why you're here. Um, but he's currently a emeritus, Dave, or you like a professor, he's still paid professor of at Imperial. <laughs> we all won the ref, didn't we? Um, so, <laughs> didn't we, Jay? <laughs> um, but yeah, so Dave is a uh, is half time professor. But um, at Imperial College London, a professor of psychiatry, he led the department there for a number of years, um, and he he is also head of research at Awaken Life Sciences. He's also head of drug science, which for those of you who don't know, I'm really lucky to be on the committee there, and that's kind of like independent sage for drugs, um, advocating for um, sensible drug policy and sort of trying to talk science to politicians as one of the things, and then drugs education, there's quite a lot of truth to power, I don't know how you want to say it, um, but, but anyway, yeah, so Dave's um, incredibly prolific, he's also an incredible researcher and has contributed massively to the addiction field and more recently has been researching psychedelics and led to some really pivotal changes in that field, um, which, as you might have noticed, is having a bit of a moment at the moment. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Dave himself. I'll just put that microphone on. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's good to be here, and it's uh, good also to see that Peter's here as well, because uh, you'll understand the first slide anyway, because it's uh, a Cornishman. <laughs> I'm Free Davy, and I, I, I always give, got to give homage to uh, to this man for several reasons, and um, not least of which that his uh, greatest invention, which is nitrous oxide, or at least uh, the the gas he popularised, uh, is now under threat from a, a woman called Patel, who's a Home Secretary, who just doesn't believe in the uh, insights that he thought it gave, and uh, you can read them there. Nothing exists but thoughts. The universe is composed of impressions, ideas, pleasures, and pains. So and that's that's the, that's what nitrous oxide does for you. So if anyone says it's uh, it's not a psychedelic, you can challenge them on that. And uh, the uh, the nice thing about it is it was it was used by some of the, the great um, writers at the time. And this is the wonderful phrase that Southey coined when he first took nitrous oxide: the atmosphere of heaven. And that's a great book, by the way. If you haven't read this book by Mike J on, uh, on the uh, nitrous oxide, you should. So we, those of you online, you heard me say this. I'm not going to dwell on it much longer. There's that, that's Humphrey Davy, the great Cordishman. Discovered more elements than anyone alive, but also as a philosopher. And he came up with this concept of chemical philosophy. And Peter and I were trying to get uh, a publisher interested in a book called Chemical Philosophy. But we haven't as yet, have we, Peter? But maybe you've got some good news for me afterwards. I don't know. Right, yes, yes. Nope. It will happen. <laughs> cool. 
Well, I'm going to now focus on serotonin because we don't know how nitrous oxide works, but we do know a lot about how these serotonergic psychedelics work. And they all work through stimulating the 5-HT2A receptor in the brain and, they, and the different doses you need for these different drugs uh, is determined entirely by the, um, by the affinity for them uh, at this 2A receptor. So you have uh, up here, you have LSD, very high affinity, very low doses, microgram doses, psilocybin, milligram, DMT, higher milligram, mescaline, you know, maybe even up to a gram a day. So the affinity predicts the uh, the dose, and that largely that tells us very categorically that these drugs all work through that receptor. And uh, I thought since there's some psychologists in the room, uh, we ought to go back to the beginnings of psychology. This man, one of the founder, founders of the discipline, William James, and after he took mescaline and nitrous oxide, he then came to this conclusion, which is a wonderful conclusion. It's a... a unimpeachable, I think. Our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. And then I've highlighted the next bit because this is really what uh, I think we should be beating the drum about. No account of the universe in its totality can be final, that leaves these disregarded. And of course, in his day, they were really struggling. They had no tools to examine brain function at all. As he said there, how to regard them is the question. But the, the reality is we can now, and that's where the big breakthrough, I think, has come through, using brain imaging to address the question of those altered forms of consciousness. But to understand how psychedelics work, we also got to understand how the brain works. And this man, Helmholtz, was the first guy to really begin to sort of articulate the way in which the brain actually creates the impressions or sensations or, or, or mental constructs, of course, are constructed by the brain. Uh, and he came to this wonderful conclusion that the brain is an inference-making machine. And that is actually, obviously, we all know that it's true, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And that's the kind of the core way in which psychedelics change brain function is by interfering with the inference-producing uh, methodology of the brain. And in terms of public consciousness, this was really the beginnings of the public's interest in, in psychedelics. And that's Aldous Huxley writing out Mescaline. And um, you all know the book, The Doors of Perception. But what a lot of people don't know is that the, the title comes from this quote from William Blake. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks in his cavern. And Blake was a visionary. He was a, obviously a brilliant artist and he could see things, uh, often things that weren't there. He could see things much, in a much more interesting way than most of us. And his view was that most humans actually didn't properly utilize the capacity of their brain. But a great insight from Huxley was to say, well, if, if mescaline has opened up my mind and opened the doors of perception, what's been, what was closing them? And of course, he came up to the right conclusion. It's the brain. The brain is an instrument for focusing the mind. And, and one of the most pleasing uh, outputs of our research has been proving him right some 50 odd years later. So where are these receptors that, that psychedelics work on? Well, they're here in the brain. So this is the brain. This is the cortex. And the highest densities are in these areas of the cortex, like posterior cingulate, anterior cingulate, it's prefrontal region. And these are the areas of the brain uh, which are most recently evolved. They're the areas of the brain which are biggest in humans. And uh, they're the areas of the brain which do the most important human things. That's where we do our thinking and, and planning and imagining, et cetera. And not so many receptors in the sensory motor cortex. And that's why psychedelics really don't have much impact on whether you can actually see things. You don't get blind if you take them. And you can still walk. But the big impact is on the thinking processes because that's where the receptors are. And when we look into the cortex, um, we discover that the highest density of these uh, receptors are on these layer five pyramidal cells. So for those of you, I don't, I, I don't want to talk down to the psychologists here, but I'm going to talk to the philosophers just so we understand how the brain works, okay? The brain is a two-dimensional computer. It does its primary computing with these pyramidal cell clusters, which are called cortical columns. And each of those has got the, the power of a, of a modern computer. Uh, and there's about 100 billion of them in the brain. So the brain, a human brain, has more computing power than all the brain, uh, all the computers on Earth at present. So the primary computing is done in this direction, orthogonal to the 
the cortex. And then to make the brain work as a whole, we have to integrate the activity of these 100 billion neurons. And that's done by these layer five pyramidal cells. So they communicate across the brain and they communicate upwards from vision and hearing from the sensory inputs and they communicate downwards from your thinking parts of the brain. And the, the concept, which I guess most of you are kind of familiar with, it, a lot of what's going on in your brain is that it's created by the brain and then fed down to, the, to essentially allow the primary or early levels of processing to to uh, evaluate what's that, what they're seeing with what you're predicting. And this concept of top-down control is driven at, through these layer five pyramidal cells. And they're loaded with these receptors. And if you stimulate, if you give them a 5-HC2A receptor, they repolarize like crazy. And that, uh, that is actually not good for the brain. And they're un kept under control by these other cells here called chandelier cells, particularly very special kind of GABA cell, inhibitory cells. So whenever these cells depolarize, they're also shut down both both these two types of cells have a lot of these 2A receptors. And, and the balance between the excitation and inhibition is quite critical. So, God, it must be nearly 15 years ago now, we actually started, started researching psilocybin, asking the question, what actually happens in the brain if you give someone a psychedelic trip in a scanner? And this is an fMRI scanner. And we did it, we took individuals who'd been, had prior experience of psychedelics because didn't think it would be good for people to have their first trip in the scanner. <laughs> of the population hate being in scanners anyway, they're phobic of them. So, uh, And uh, we gave them a shot of psilocybin uh, and they had the full range of elemental hallucinations of Christmas tree lights. Most of them had some kind of ego dissolution. They floated out into space. One went to heaven and, and bowed at the foot of God. They all came back, so that was good. And then we could scan their, analyze, analyze their brains. And to our amazement, we didn't find any increased activity. We just found areas of the brain where there was decreased activity. And these are these two areas here where there's a high density of these 2A receptors, the anterior and posterior cingulate. And those are the thalamus. And this is almost a secondary effect, this is, but there is a loop between the three. And we thought we must have done the experiment wrong. So then we repeated the whole experiment using a different kind of fMRI. That was ASL, after it has been labeling when we did bold. And we got the same results. And we realized we'd actually hit on something rather interesting because there's a sort of adage I've, I've had it over my lifetime. If you find something that's exactly the opposite of what you predict, you're gonna, you must be right. <laughs> because there's no manipulating the data, there's no massaging the statistics. And you know, twice in my life, I've done experiments which have been given it's exactly the opposite, and they've turned out to be very interesting. And there was a clear relationship between the um, uh, reduction in activity in brain regions and the subjective effects. And this is this image is the wrong image because I can't get rid of it. It's the right image on a Mac, it's the wrong image on a PC. That's the thalamus, I know. And I know that the rest is the anterior cingulate, but we, somehow that I can't, that's why I'd like to show it on my machine. But anyway, the bottom line is wherever you look, it was thalamus, anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate, the intensity of the effects was associated with the reductions in brain flow. But the other thing that became really clear was that the psychedelics had a powerful disrupting effect on the default mode network. Now, I don't know if you, I'll just talk you through, I apologize for those of you who know it well, but if you don't know it, just in case you don't know it, it's important you do know it. So the default mode network is a network that has only been discovered as a result of brain imaging. And it's a network which uh, encompasses this anterior cingulus and frontal cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex and these two lateral parietal regions. And it's called the default mode because it's active when you're not doing anything other than thinking. So we should call it the philosopher's network, really, shouldn't we? But, um, <laughs> but we're maybe we can take that up later. So let's all activate our default mode networks now, except me, right? So when I, when I stop speaking, you're going to close your eyes, because close your eyes now. And when I stop, please close your eyes, close your eyes. When I stop speaking, I want you to reflect and what you hope to get out of this talk. Okay, you can open your eyes now. Now, if I was scanning you, this network would be showing the most activity because that's where you do your internal thinking about yourself, about the present, the past, the future, your evaluation of decisions, etc. So when you're not hearing things, you're not hearing things, the auditory cortex is shut off, motor cortex, you're not moving, visual cortex. It's called the default mode because that's where you, it's what's, it's, active is dominant when you're not doing anything else and that's where your sense your ego is embedded and i guess if you're religious that's probably where your soul is too 
But psychedelics completely disrupt that. There is no default mode. And that explains why people have this sense of not being a person, or they may atomize when they float out into, into space. Particularly this massively, massive switching off the posterior cingulate cortex. So this is where you integrate all your senses. This is where you integrate your sense of seeing and hearing and touch and proprioception. And if you can't integrate that, you don't have a sense of self or body because, because that's where your sense of body and position in space is located. So psychedelics have this profound disrupting effect. They also disrupt other circuits too, but the default mode is the one that's most relevant for most of what we're talking about today because the default mode is all because it encodes you. It also encodes disorders like depression. And that's, that discovery really what I found extremely pleasing because it, it kind of fitted exactly with what, um, what Huxley had said. We, the default mode is, the, in a sense, the reducing valve. And uh, psychedelics disrupt the ability of the brain to focus the mind. And then the mind can run free. It takes away the controller of the mind. And I guess most of you realize your mind is being controlled, not by outside influences, but by inside influences called your brain. So just to give you an example of how this does translate into making sense of the experience, I'm going to use visual. The visual hallucinations of psychedelics are very prominent, very obvious, sometimes very attractive. Uh, and how do they happen? Well, as you all know, your brain is not a camera. Your brain doesn't take pictures of the outside world. Uh, if it did that, it would fill up its memory banks before you were one year old. So it does it a much more efficient thing, which is it takes information from outside, it turns the, the, the power of the photons um, wavelength and whether they're moving and, uh, and it puts and it then decodes all that in the retina, the retina then sends impulses to the, to the visual cortex, so the visual cortex reconstructs what you thinks out there and the first five or six years of life is all about working out uh, from your estimates, your internal inferences, your, your Helmholtz principles of inference, whether your inferences are right, testing them, you think it's a chair, you walk into it, it hurts you, it is a chair, so you gradually learn that a chair is something that's got solidity, etc. But there's also another aspect to it as well, which we'll come to a bit later on. The brain can also, of course, create images of what you want to see. You know, that's called love and marriage, but we're coming. <laughs> but the problem is when you take psychedelics that the, the, the reconstruction process of the visual system which which take with you know there's there will be billions of neurons reconstructing a single image the, the connections of those are through those layer five pyramidal cells if you disrupt that process then you can't reconstruct what's out there but to, what you would normally reconstruct and so that's why that's why you see you get these hallucinations and what's remarkable about this is because it's utterly predictive some of the classic work of people like Hubel and Weasel predicted that the primary processing of the visual system is in these very simple building blocks of circles, spirals, rectangles, and simple movements. And under psychedelics, you can, for the only time in your life, you were seeing this as a baby, but you couldn't remember that. So the only time in your, your memory, memoric life, you can actually see the primary workings of your visual cortex. And I think that's very cute, actually. I think that's one of the, one of the nicest things that we've actually discovered. I find that quite entertaining. <laughs> but something else surprising happened when we started analyzing these data. We, having the first big data set on, on, on a psychedelic, you know, imaging of a psychedelic, we got approached by at least three different groups of biomathematicians. We set them to work to find the most beautiful image this won the prize. So this is Paul Expert's group at King's. So this is a statistical map of connectivity in the brain. There's 7,200 connections in both of those circles. And uh, you can see they're very different. On the left-hand side is the normal brain. On the right-hand side is the psilocybin brain, or the brain under psilocybin. Now, the normal brain, this is what's called the small world brain. One of the reasons the brain is so efficient, it's 10 times more energy efficient than any known computer, is because it doesn't waste its time doing things it doesn't need to do. It makes predictions, and if it's right, it continues with them. If it's wrong, it updates. So most of the computing in the brain is around the edge. So the visual cortex talk to the visual cortex, auditory cortex to auditory cortex. Of course, there's got to be some cross cortex activity. If you see a bus bearing down on you, then you've got to get your legs moving to get out of the way. But there's not a lot. So in the normal situation, your brain is actually pretty restricted, this small world concept. 
But on the side of cybing, your ma- the brain is massively connected. And that's because you've broken down the processes which keep it separ- segregated. And this is going to be a theme that comes through a lot of the other data I'm going to show you. And this hyperconnectivity is a statistical phenomenon, bits of the brain which you never see talking to each other normally when you image a brain, start to, 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 start to respond synchronously. And that has huge implications. It's kind of putting your brain back to the state it was before your parents and your schools and everything else constrained you to doing this. I mean, this is a very important way of being because otherwise you wouldn't be able to find your way around, you know, you wouldn't be able to speak languages and that. But it is constraining. And under psilocybin, those constraints are broken down temporarily. And, and as I'll show you later, the breaking down of those constraints gives people insights into disorders like their depression. It also gives them insights in how they might change. And that's one of the powerful explanations as to why you can have a lot of personality change or mood change as a result of something else. So we then went on and did LSD, the first proper LSD study. And, uh, and we did this in a very scientific way. This is Leo Roseman's work. So we plotted out V1, this visual one, the primary visual cortex in each of our volunteers. And then we looked at connectivity under placebo, under LSD. And this is a small world. Most your visual cortex is largely doing very little. I mean, mostly now, you know, every, you're seeing nothing except when that picture changes, it looks up, you know, spend a few seconds looking at it. And then you, it's you, most of what you do is in your V1 and V2. And there's a little bit of cross talk to the hippocampus. You might want to remember one of the slides, perhaps, hopefully. Under LSD, V1 is connected everywhere. And that's why people have these enormously powerful and interesting and, and very you know, active uh, hallucinations with their eyes closed under LSD. It's like a full dreaming state. It's not exactly the same as dreaming, but it's very similar. To, so that's the nearest it'll be for the you who, who haven't taken psychedelics. And that really does prove the opening up of the, of, of the, of the mind or the brain uh, under LSD. Now, getting this stuff published was actually quite challenging because we discovered that not every referee was as interested in psychedelics as we were. And we've got these wonderful criticisms. It's all just blood flow changes from 5-HT receptors on blood vessels. Well, wouldn't that happen everywhere in the brain? Uh, what do you expect if you mess with the brain with psychedelics? I thought, you know, I'd expected better, better refereeing, really. I mean, come on. And then I realized, I realized that's what we should have expected. Because this is a wonderful quote from Huxley. Now, this is not anything to do, this is about politics. It's nothing to do with science, but it's what all of you who are scientists should write that down and stick it above your desk. Orthodoxy is a diehard of the world of thought. It learns not, and neither can it forget. And that is such a challenge. We don't, the orthodox, we won't understand the brain doing the kind of orthodox things that people have done up to now. Psychedelics are unorthodox. We have to think about it. It allows us to think differently about it. Anyway, we rose to the challenge. Okay, it's all blood flow. Well, how can we measure brain activity that, which isn't dependent on changes in blood flow, which of course MRI is. We went to Cardiff with the MEG system. MEG, magnetoencephalography, measures the magnetic changes produced by the electrical activity of neurons. Very reliable, very predictable, very good time resolution. Did the same experiment and got the same results. And this, so what we see here, these are different frequencies. You know, you probably all know you can divvy up the brain into the, the, the the electric activity of the brain can be segregated into different power ranges. This is low frequency. This is higher frequency. This is higher frequency. Again, the alpha rhythm being a, a very dominant rhythm, the 10 hertz rhythm, which is a kind of resting rhythm of the brain. And then there's this higher frequency, um, the beta rhythm. And you see, particularly in the posterior cingulate cortex, there's a profound disruption of, of, of synchronized oscillator activity. Effectively, the posterior signal is switched off. And that's why you don't feel a body because you can't put it together, all those inputs to, to make you feel a body. And, and that switching off of the posterior singular is strongly associated with um, ego dissolution. The greater the dissolution, the greater the switching off of this region here. And what's, there's another interesting, I'll just throw on a side out, we can talk about it later. As we published this, there was a neurosurgeon in France published a single case of someone with a tumour in the posterior cingulate who was being, having stimulations there to try to work out where they should cut out the tumour. And every time they stimulated that region, we think they switched off the outflows and the person went into a completely different state. 
he went into another, not another, it wasn't actually another universe, but he went into a very different place in a very reliable way. So we've got some, cor some, some corroborative evidence that that region altering the posterior singlet, which is this profound alterations in where you are in the world. He thought he'd, he'd gone to the Pacific Island and it was a reliable. No, the great thing about Meg is that you can actually, it's, the time resolution is so much better than fMRI that you can actually ask questions of, where you can test theories about the nature of the oscillatory activity in the brain. And this is a work we did with Rosalind Franklin and, um, and her team at UCL, Carl Friston's team. And they created a little model here. They created this little two pyramidal cell, two interneuron model of how the cortex produces its um, oscillations. And so we, we took the data from the precuneus here, and you can see this is the alpha rhythm here under placebo, and this is how it disappears under the psilocybin. And we tested their four theories using this thing called dynamic causal modeling. Uh, and uh, they had four hypotheses as to how these four neurons might create alpha rhythm. And it turns out that the most credible hypothesis is it is the layer five pyramidal cells uh, because psilocybin disrupts it so much. And I think that's the first example in human, uh, of anyone showing in human brain an effect of a, any drug or even a neurotransmitter on a particular function of a cortical neuron. But if I'm wrong, let me know. Now, Meg is a really powerful way of exploring a whole range of drug effects. So you get these kind of brain prints and all, most drugs are different. The ones that aren't actually the psychedelics, they all produce this very reliable, powerful disruption of brain uh, synchrony. So this is basically, let me explain what this means. So we're looking at these different frequencies, right? These low frequencies, these high frequencies in the brain, in the cortex. If it's red, there's more power. These frequencies have got more and more, larger and larger and larger in terms of their amplitude. If it's cold, there's less power. They've got smaller and smaller and smaller in their amplitude. And the little crosses are significant differences. And what you see here is that the psychedelics, ketamine, psilocybin, LSD, produce profound desynchrony of the brain. What we call it an entropic brain. The brain becomes completely disorganized. If you look on the other side, here, here, here are GABA drugs, Zolpidema, sleeping pill, GABA, Gaboxadol, an extrasynaptic GABA agonist, puts people into strange states, Tiagabina, anti-convulsant up, GABA uptake blocker, puts, puts people into catalepsy where they can't move. Their brains are so synchronized that you can't actually move because you need some flexibility in your brain to do anything. Uh, and then, of course, there's alcohol in the middle, which is a kind of probably more GABAergic, a bit glutamatergic, but definitely not a psychedelic. So the key thing is that psychedelics produce fast, and they destroy cortical synchrony, they produce entropy. I want to show you some data with DMT, because it's, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on DMT. It's being developed by a couple of companies now as a possible antidepressant. There's some work of Chris Timmerman, who's been doing this for quite a few years now, so starts with his PhD in Stan. So he started off doing EEG, and now he's moved to fMRI. So these are the, this, is, this is just an, a spider plot of what happens if you give someone DMT. Now, we, we, DMT can't be taken orally unless it's in the form of ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a, a drink which contains DMT from a plant and a, a substance called harmaline from another plant. The harmaline breaks, prevents the breakdown of the DMT. So harmaline is the monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. You drink the drink together, the MAOB inhibition allows the DMT to go into your body. We can't use ayahuasca because we don't know how much DMT is in it. So we use um, pure DMT and we eject it, in a, an infusion over about two minutes. And you, this is what you see here is placebo. Placebo doesn't do much. That little blob there, that's the spider, I guess. And then this is uh, all the, the, ch the big changes. And the huge, the effects of DMT are prof often very powerful. This with very powerful imagery, like I've shown you before, sense of disembodiment. Uh, sometimes a bit of bliss, some spiritual experiences, unity, et cetera. So we can see we can produce quite a profound um, psychedelic experience with DMT. And this is what happened, this is the EEG. So the dotted line is our predicted time course of EEG in the plasma based on our knowledge of the kinetics of, e, uh, of DMT. Here's placebo, it doesn't do anything. And here's DMT, you see, as it gets in, into the brain, it completely destroys alpha rhythm just like the other psychedelics. And then alpha rhythm comes back as the DMT washes out the brain, the alpha rhythm comes back. So 
all, that's why I say they're all pretty much the same. And we're now trying to do a five methoxy DMT study. To, I imagine it's going to be the same as hard to imagine. And the other thing to say is we know all these, the effects of all these drugs are blocked by 5 ec 2 blockers. So, yeah. But more recently, and this is unpublished data now, we've been looking at fMRI and EEG simultaneously to ask some more interesting questions about what's going on in the brain. And uh, I'll just introduce this to you. So what we've got here are um, two sets of brain images looking at differences between DMT and placebo. Uh, this one's in terms of functional connectiv connectivity and intensity, and this is in terms of functional connectivity and plasma levels of DMT. You see that relatively similar. The, 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 it looks as if the plasma concentrations produce an effect which is uh, very similar to, to, to measures of intensity, which is quite interesting as well because there are companies now that are saying, well, maybe we, you know, maybe we can just measure intensity. Maybe the subjective experience is enough for us to predict the clinical outcome. We don't have to do the plasma levels, and to some extent, you know, this ever this supports that view. But the interesting thing is down here. So the interesting thing is, this is connectivity in the brain, global functional connectivity. And these are the these are the key regions we look at: the visual, the visual, the system, the visual system here, the default mode network, the frontoparietal network, the salience network. This is the um, uh, executive network uh, and the sensory mode. And you see that connectivity, particularly of these regions, the frontoparietal default mode network and the salience network, is massively increased under DMT. And there's another measure, which is integrity, how locked in are these networks themselves? And they become, their, their integrity is, is reduced. And they're obviously, they're opposite sides of the same coin. You reduce integrity, you almost always are going to increase connectivity, but you, not necessarily. But anyway, it, it goes, it, this, is, this is as we would predict. And then we've got the EG data. This is EG collected in the, uh, in the scanner too. And again, so you see, you see what I showed you before, that DMT produces a profound attenuation, particularly the alpha rhythm, you know, this, this desynchronization of the, these, uh, this particular rhythm. And um, we also got a measure of signal diversity, how much, how chaotic are the EG signals? This is the thing called the lempel ziv factor. And uh, signal diversity increases under DMT. But down here is something that's kind of novel. We, I didn't know about this until you know, these talented students doing this work. Apparently there's something, the, the concept of top-down control can be measured using, a, well, people believe this, I think it's, it makes, it's incredible, that you can see these traveling waves in the brain, which come from the front of the brain and go back. And, and that seemed to be a measure of um, top-down control. You can also see waves in the back of the brain that go forward, which is when you, know, if you see something, obviously you've got to project your visual cortex uh, reconstruction forward. And here, this is the first evidence that psychedelics disrupt this top-down control. So here you see that the backward traveling waves are, are reduced. And this, you know, this is the first sort of support of the idea that we really are disrupting top-down control. And the forward traveling waves are increased. And that's why you can see your visual cortex working because your top-down control is not telling you there is a chair, your bottom-up control is saying, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Is it a chair? <laughs> it's a flower. That, that's a flower, yeah. So you, that's a kind of, that's really, I think, to my mind, this is a, a really rather elegant finding because it actually, for the first time, you can see the brain processing the changing in a way which would explain the psychedelic experience. And you know, here's the same thing I showed you before, the massive disruption of the algorithm. And one of the things that we were funded to do this work by psychonauts who were really interested. There are people who love DMT because DMT takes them when they, are, they usually smoke it or snort it and they go very rapidly from a state of normal consciousness to a state of different consciousness. Often they go to a different universe and in that universe they often see things with entities who are often welcoming and interesting and talk to them. 
uh, and, and many people are really attracted by this and they're kind of they're regular users of DMT and one of them was quite rich so he funded this research because because he wanted to know what DMT did in the brain and I wanted to know where the entities were because I was thinking they're probably in the brain but I you know it's possible that they're not maybe you do go to another universe DMT aficionados no question they they don't think it's the brain at all they, you know, they're, they're absolutely through the wormhole anyway so what we tried to get some handle on this by um by getting people to do so when we started off this research we did some dose finding to find out how much people could tolerate in the scanner and we got to draw the experiences when they came out so this is the, uh, the lower dose the seven milligram iv and people could draw these elemental hallucinations and then then at 14 milligrams they began to get the more interesting kind of these more uh, octopoid uh, snake like things but then the high doses they started drawing pictures of their creatures what was that person and that is interesting isn't it and where do they come from? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I have some theories, but I'm not going to share them with you yet because I don't want it to go public yet. Anyway, back to, back to some facts. Um, we, um, so as a result of this, I, I've been sort of thinking, well, there are two different aspects of consciousness we can at least lay claim to in terms of um, what we've discovered. So this is this red one is normal consciousness. This is the consciousness that most people work on when they're particularly interested in arousal and the effects of anesthetics, etc. It's a consciousness that's dictated by glutamate. Glutamatic neurons <coughs> determine everything you have learned in your whole life, and certainly everything you've learned this afternoon, if anything, has been due to glutamate being released on neurons and changing their long-term potentiation. So and that's fantastic. Because, and that produces a phenomenon of, of wonderful parcellation. The detail, which you you know, the human brain's ability to dissect detail is just, it's kind of overwhelming. When you take a psychedelic, something different happens. Uh, you don't get parcellation, you get integration. Things change. You still remember everything. I mean, those of you who've got friends who've taken trips and once you've heard them for the third time, you kind of wish they'd forgotten them. But, um, <laughs> but the reality is you don't forget because you, psychedelics don't interfere with this process at all, but they do change the meaning. Uh, and you get an altered valence, often very positive, you get the sense of meaning, even if there isn't any, to all people, but, and you get integration, making, bringing things together, making sense of, uh, not, you don't just remember your past, but you kind of make sense of it in a different way. And that, again, is one aspect of why they're so powerful in terms of helping people change the way they think. I also want to throw this in. Any of you working on color vision here? Have you got any vision scientists here? Oh, I'll just throw it in because it's entertaining and no one yet understands how it works. So there's always a chance one of you might have an idea. So one of the things we discovered that some of our volunteers had color blindness and afterwards they said, wow, that's amazing. You know, we, I, color vision's improved. And we went back, well, Cuxley wrote this in 1954, mescaline raises all colors to a higher power and makes the percipient aware of innumerable fine chains of difference, which at ordinary times, he is completely blind. So everyone knows that, you know, that's what psychedelics do. They massively increase your perception of many things, not just color, but, but certainly color is one of them. Why is that? Well, we don't know, but this is a, this is a true case. So this is uh, this famous Monet picture of Venice. And here's one of our subjects. All my life, I suffered from red dichromacy protonopia, a painting which I'd previously seen as a dull mass of brown and blue. All of the colors I was previously unable to see were there on the screen. And the emotion I felt made me unable to speak for about half an hour. So what had happened, his brother, who was really into art, had given him some mushrooms, taken him to see the picture. He kind of had this, uh, this ability to see what his brother was seeing. Uh, and you can see it's a very powerful over uh, emotional effect. So we thought, we've got so, a number of these. We, we actually got the Global Drug Survey, uh, Adam Winstock, so we'll just say, to slot in some questions about colour vision. So every year, you know, they interview about 100,000 people. And we asked them, to fill, if you were colour blind, would you fill in some questions? And that was the, that's what we asked them. And then the paper's been written up um, in that uh, really, uh, that journal, the Drug Science Medicine, which is the journal that the charity Drug Science uh, um, set up in runs. And basically, we asked people, if you're colour blind, did you have colour changes with psychedelics? Or do you have no colour changes? And we also asked people if they had other colour changes if they weren't colour blind. We got 382 responses, 88 of them were kind of meaningful, and about 50-50. So 
23 colorblind people said they had better color perception after psychedelics, and 24 said they didn't. I thought that was really quite intriguing. But why did that happen? Oh, some of them also said their visual acuity improved, not just their sense of color. And 10 of them said that this color vision improved beyond the trip. And that is very interesting. And that's possibly a measure of neuroplasticity, which we'll talk about. I don't know why this happens. I've been digging around, and I've actually talked to some of the top vision scientists in the country, and they say it's impossible because color vision resides in the retina. And I said, I don't think it can really, because it, think something's changed in the brain. This is, this is not likely to be a retina effect. But uh, one of the interesting things is that the color vision starts off being bilateral and gets lateralized. And I think that process of lateralization in itself tells you the brain isn't interested in color. Unless you're, unless you're into color, unless you're an artist, color doesn't really matter. That's why I dress so uncomfortably, you know. My wife said, you can't put that together. And I say, why not? It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Most, I don't care about, you know, color to me is an irrelevance, uh, um, except, you know, well, occasionally, maybe in a mushroom, I don't know. But, uh, so it might be that the brain downplays the value of color because it's not that useful. And, and we've released that repression because there's a hell of a lot, of, a lot, as you all know, a lot of what's going on in the brain is actually stopping things happening rather than making things happen. Uh, if you've got any ideas, share it. And I'll just move on to the end because I want to talk about depression and why we wanted to study depression. And it's obviously a huge problem, and treatments aren't that good, and young people are suffering more. But when I started working with psychedelics, I wasn't interested, never imagined I'd be working in depression. I just wanted to know what the psychedelic. I have given more drugs to human, different kinds of drugs to human beings, certainly, than, I'm sure, anyone alive, and not an occasion being with the animal. <laughs> And I, but we'd never been allowed to do psychedelics because they were illegal. So I thought, so, you know, we, having been sacked by the government, what else could they do for me? So I thought, let's. Do it. So it was in a scientific prelude, but it turned out to be fascinating translational medicine because we we did a study in resistant depression because we found that things like default mode being disrupted by psychedelics, the default mode is overactive in depression. So we thought, get it, let's disrupt it and see if we can lift depression. And we did. So this is the first study. Of, Treatment resistant depression, 20 patients, all failed on these two antidepressants, all failed on CBT, some have failed on 10 antidepressants. And wow, 50% you know, reduction a week later. We actually, if we measured it a day later, it would have been there too. And this is a powerful, powerful, this is the most powerful treatment, single dose treatment of depression there's ever been. And it peaked at five weeks, and significant. These are, these are the Cohen's Ds. And it's still very simple in six months, although this, at this point we had no control over what they were doing. So this is an amazing finding, and in fact it spawned at least 40 companies now are doing research on psilocybin. It hasn't spawned any more grants. The only, uh, my last five grants at the MRC have all been turned down, but you know, I guess that's part of your course too. Why does it work? Well, I, I intimated this earlier on, this psychedelics break down the way in which your brain orchestrates thinking. And I think three things happen in the psychedelics and depressed people. The first is that they can actually remember things that might cause their depression, things that they would have repressed. And one of the theories about rumination in depression is, is a way of trying to avoid confronting the truth, the reality. It's, kind of, it's a way of deflecting the person away from confronting the situation. So that's the first thing. You would maybe you break down that resistance. You can actually come to terms, see what's happening. One of, I give example. One of our patients. He said during my trip, I saw my father abusing me, and I was. I said to him, "That's it. It's over. I've got closure. You never do it again." And that was very, very empowering to him when he came out of the trip. And uh, and he, he did extremely well because it was exactly the fact that incident seemed to be on his mind all the time. And we've seen this also with veterans. You know, I've got a veteran who. He spent five, maybe it was probably seven years with his dead friend on his shoulder. They were both in a truck in Afghanistan, the truck gets blown up, friend's dead, but the friend's not dead, the friend is there and he's on there every day. He couldn't get rid of the friend's ghost there. And then there was a psychedelic trip, the people take a bite. So this kind of powerful dealing with uh, hurts and trauma, that's the first thing. The second thing is you can think differently about yourself. You might, you know, you can think, I don't have to be critical. Maybe I am a good person. I am a good person. And, they, and the third thing is that the, um, the, 
neuroplasticity effects of psychedelics so that you can not only realize you're a good person, but you can remember and you can lay down a pathway, which is I am a good person, that be, can be persistent. And many people have long lasting, a lot of people say that psychedelics, you know, one of the five most important experiences of their life. And, and usually akin to having children, but not necessarily getting married. Now, there are, um, we're not the only people, I don't want to sort of take lay claim to this. There are two very nice studies from the States looking at end of people with end of life anxiety and depression, which is a really interesting utility for psychedelics. Some of you will know that Huxley uh, effectively died having, he asked his wife to give him a big dose of LSD and so he could die quickly. Um, there's a study from Johns Hopkins looking at depression, taking people um, with depression and randomizing them to psilocybin or staying on the waiting list and they did quite well on psilocybin and then they switched them over. There's ayahuasca, several studies, ayahuasca depression, smoking, quitting, alcoholism, two open trials. And there are other trials going on, resistant depression, compass pathways, anorexia, we're doing OCD, we're doing, and Yale are doing pain syndromes, we're doing. You might say what they all got in common and what they've all got in common is they're all internalizing disorders. They're all disorders in which people get locked into, into thought loops which they often resent. I mean, people with OCD, half of them know it's ridiculous, but they can't stop. Most addicts don't even like the drug, but they have to take it. They're compelled to take it by something in their brain. Um, so we think that these disorders are almost certainly related to that, an internal process of repetitive thinking that you can't escape from. Psychedelics can disrupt those brain processes. So we set out to test this theory, and this is a study we published last year. It was a, a trial comparing psilocybin, two treatments, with escitalopram six weeks. But um, it was based on this theory. A couple of years before, Robin Carter Harris, who was one of my PhD student and postdoc, who's now gone out to the States. Um, and he's gone to the States, by the way, because he couldn't get any funding in Britain. He was turned down four times for fellowships. Uh, so he said, sorry, and they gave him a chair and see if Anyway, um, we wrote this paper together thinking that there are, we think there are two ways you can live depression. The first is the traditional way, which is through SSRIs or other antidepressants, and they work in the limbic system. They increase serotonin levels here by blocking reuptake. And that increased serotonin works on the 5-HT1A receptor, which is the only inhibitory serotonin receptor. That dampens down amygdala and limbic activity. And you may know that one of the most powerful, consistent findings of imaging findings in depression is heightened amygdala reactivity. Depressed people, the amygdalas are overreactive to stress. You show them, show them a threatening face, their amygdala lights up more than a normal person. This limbic hyperactivity is a, perhaps the cardinal feature of depression. Uh, it's, it's a very, very reliable finding. Uh, and the theory is, and this is a theory been developed by uh, groups in Oxford and, and, and in Yale, that antidepressants inhibit limbic activity. So they protect the limbic system. Uh, they blunt their response to stress and the brain then heals. So my analogy is like a plaster cast. If you break your leg, you put your leg in a plaster cast, the plaster cast allows the bone to stay in the right place and it heals and it takes a few weeks or months to heal. Antidepressants put the limbic system in a plaster cast and allows it to heal from the, overcome the stress that's caused depression. And that's why it takes six, eight weeks for the, for the depression to lift. But the, 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 unfortunately, the corollary of that plaster cast is that you not just reduce, you don't just reduce responsivity to stress, you also respond, reduce responsivity to pleasure. And that is a phenomenon that many patients describe as emotional blunting. But they, you do get resilience. Now, psychedelics, we believe, work in the cortex. Well, we know they work in the cortex. They work in a different receptor. They produce dramatic perturbations of cortical synchrony, produce entropy. They break down this perceptive thinking, and they lead to cognitive flexibility, which lifts depression, but also may improve well-being. And, and, and this is something I'm going to show you now. They're very difficult to do these trials in a way which gives you what we call clinical equipoise. Uh, we thought long and hard about this, and we decided to do this study. Everyone was recruited into the study. Everyone got, they knew they were going to get cytosine, but they were randomized either to two trips, 25 milligrams, or to two low doses, two one milligram doses. Now, they mostly they could tell them apart, 
but they all got the same psychotherapy, the preparation for the trip, the presence of two therapists during the trip, and the integration sessions interpreting the experience of the trip afterwards. They all got the same amount of psychotherapy, which explains why the escitalopram group did extremely well, actually. It was a very good outcome for them. And if you want, you can see this. The, the, the BBC Two documentary was called The Psychedelic Dog Trial. It shows the process. It's interesting. What do we find? Yeah, sorry, this has moved because we're on a different um, screen. But here's the depression scores. You see the first, first psilocybin trip, which is a powerful reduction in depression scores, which persist. Maybe we got a bit bigger after the second trip, but this could be a floor effect. Escitalopram, remarkably faster acting than normal because of the psychotherapy associated with the first administration. Overall, the psilocybin did better on almost all measures, and particularly on this measure. And this is a measure of remission rates. And you can see remission rates vary enormously depending on what scale you use, but at least 50 percent, and sorry, 100, you know, doubling remission rates at least uh, for the psilocybin compared to the brand. And remission is what we're trying to target because remission means no depression. And remission also means better well being. And this is where psychedelics do have this very profound benefit. They improve well being. This is the Edinburgh Warwick well being, or Warwick Edinburgh well being scale. And although antidepressants improve well-being, probably because they lift depression, psychedelics do it better. And that could be because these have got the baggage of uh, blunting of affect, or it could be because you're thinking differently after psilocybin. And I think it could be that this is increased cortical connectivity. So what evidence do we have that that happens? Well, this is the study we came out, um, sorry, it came out last week, you know, week before. Um, so this is looking at connectivity between different brain circuits. The circuits I've shown you before, the, uh, the deep port mode network, the um, executive network, the uh, salience network. Connectivity increases. So the, the measure we use is a measure of modularity. This is a measure of disconnection, which gets less following psilocybin. The default mode is overconnected and it gets less connected after psilocybin. And it gets more connected with the uh, executive network and the salience network. And what's remarkable that this reduction in modularity predicted outcome at six months. So this measure was done one day after the trip, and it predicted six months outcome. Amazing. So that was the first depression study. The second depression study, the one I, the acetanoprime study, we did it before and three weeks after the second psychedelic dose. And here again, you see connectivity is increased. Modularity is decreased in the psilocybin group. It's not decreased in the telebrand group. And again, the de increased connectivity, the decreased modularity predicts moderately well the outcome in terms of the uh, mood change. And this is an example, particularly how the executive network is better connected. And that explains, I think, why depressed people can think more clearly because their executive network gets trapped or it actually gets repressed by the the default mode network doing all this negative thinking and it, can, it's, it becomes less efficient and suppress people struggle with attentional and executive tasks. So here's, a, here's a, a, a visual analogy which I think hopefully makes sense of what's going on. So in depression we think the brain becomes more modular, the, the, the functions become more separated uh, and, and you can visualize it as a series of troughs and valleys and it's a you know, I, like the, I don't know if this analogy works, but I'll try it on you. It's a bit like living in Switzerland. If you're in one valley, you're speaking French, and if you're in another valley, you're speaking German. And you don't even know the other person speaking German because you never go across, it's just too difficult to get up there. So depressed people get locked into a thinking, negative, negative, negative thoughts, which of course, you know, everyone knows, you know, we've all got a negative thought network somewhere in our brain, you know, as soon as we've all had grief, as soon as you have grief, you immediately get locked into that. But that, in depression, you can't get out of it. Now, psychedelics flatten this landscape, and that's, that's this hyper-connectivity I showed you. Thoughts can go everywhere. But afterwards, you don't go back to where you were before. You go back to a more connected brain, and that more connected brain means your brain's more fluent, and it's more able to deal with problems. It means it, we've got ratings of connectivity which go up. People are more connected to other people. They're more connected to nature, but their brain is also more connected. And I just find that really, really rather, you know, that's rather beautiful, isn't it? It sort of makes sense of the subjective experience in a way which imaging studies probably never do. 
And here's a couple of quotes from some patients. My outlook has changed significantly. I'm more aware now it's pointless to get wrapped up in endless negativity. I feel as if I've seen a much clearer picture. My mind works differently. I ruminate much less and my thoughts feel ordered, contextualized. Rumination was like thoughts out of context, out of time. Now my thoughts feel like they make sense with context and logical flow. Well, those are quite well-educated patients, but uh, you, uh, you get the message. And this, this, I'd never heard of this journal of humanistic psychology until we published it. And then this is the narratives of the first group of patients. And they're just so, so impressive and so moving. I mean, if you, if you really want to understand what it's like to be depressed and how nice it is to be undepressed, then we... I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish by just going, moving from, well, using vision as the starting point, getting back to where we were before, but to emphasize this phenomenon that, that the brain creates images, narratives, concepts, which may not be right. And um, I'm going to go back to, to, to uh, Blake and to Huxley. Blake saying that man sees through the chinks of his cavern. When we see things, we don't see the big picture. Our brain, our small world brain focuses on seeing what's important to keep the brain fed and watered and sleep. But for most of us, that narrows the chink through our cavern. At least it's a blue sky and it's white clouds. It's pleasant, but not very, not very interesting or, or rewarding perhaps. But in depression, what depressed people see is a, is a gray, miserable world. And what addicts see is their love object. And their whole focus of their life is distorted by the way in which their brain dictates their attentional processes and also their emotional processes. And then just another wonderful quote from Blake, which he was talking about why humans fight wars, why people became soldiers. Um, and he said, humans create mind forged manacles and he's right, our minds do create manacles. The mind creates the manacles, the brain then takes over the manacle and psychedelics can break these. And, uh, and that's uh, why I think they work. And since you're all philosophers, you know about this philosopher, this is a great social philosopher, George Bernard Shaw, those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And I think psychedelic treatment has changed the minds of our patients because it's changed their brains. And of course, what we've got to do now is change the minds of our, the public, which won't be difficult, and the politicians, which could be seriously challenging. But hopefully we will, and hopefully we will have them back into medical practice where they should have been for the last 50 years. So thanks very much. And I'll just say a bit about the book, which we've gone around. So this, um, there's a bit about the brain and mind in this book. This book is a, real, a primer for psychology undergraduates um, and doc in doctors. It, it's got a bit about the brain, and particularly neurochemistry and neuropharmacology, and a bit about mental illness and the different syndromes. Uh, but the good thing is all the, all the proceeds go to the charity Drug Science. And if you go on the website and say you're a student, even if you're not, you get it at half price. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and that's really fascinating. Thanks so much. Um, has anyone got any questions? So I'm just going to, if I turn this on, then I can. Oh, it's working. Um, anyone any questions? Hey, Natalia. I'll come out over to you. Yeah, you need the mic because the people on Zoom are working. Thanks. That was really fascinating. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on whether there's any overlap with the mechanisms of deep brain stimulation for depression and OCD. Yeah, that's a really great question. So. In order, because I was told I could only speak for an hour, I cut out half the slides. But there is a we have a, I have a very good slide. So one of the we, there were two reasons we did depression. The first was I talked about the default mode network being disrupted. But what drives the default mode into hyperconnectivity and depression is the, sub, the subgenual cingulate cortex. You know, one of the reasons we persuaded funders to do the depression study was because we could psilocybin switches off immediately switches off the the, the, um, the default mode sorry it switches off the subgenual as do all sorts of other treatments and that the seminal study was the seminal study of Helen Mayberg who showed that placebo you get better on placebo the default mode network is less active and that's why she switched it off so that was a 2002 paper 2005 she did a deep brain stimulation switch it off so yeah, it seems that that's a very consistent finding of many different antidepressants that they dampen down activity of the of the subgenual, and it's the subgenual which drives this hyperconnectivity of the default mode. Any other questions? 
Oh. Not many people see God when they're having a deep brain stimulation. That, there is a difference. Well, they do say they suddenly experience emotions that have long been suppressed. That's long absolutely long. right. They escape. Yeah, you switch off this. And why the subgenual is driving this negative affect is fascinating. I mean, that's one of the really interesting questions. But it's like a release. People will report absolutely. and let the light get the ring gets brighter. Well, that's also and that might be the, yeah, so yeah, they're um this is there's a wonderful game since we're, we've got philosophers here as well as so so William James also suffered from depression and he wrote about his depression he said this is a, a wholly unnatural state of mind where it is as if something is being forced into my mind that makes me miserable and it is this weird thing that people become they don't want to be depressed, but something drives their depression. And it's that subgenual singular. And if you switch it off, the depression does immediately lift. In, in, not in everyone, but it's certainly in some people. Oh, sorry, I think it's me. I was waiting. Go. Oh. Right. Volume on the... Ah, sorry. <laughs> um, I know you said you didn't do anything with um, ayahuasca because you can't drug... because you can't dose depend it. Um, how do you get the dosage on these sort of things? And then yeah. is that related to like stuff happening later? Basically, my sister went on one of those jungle things, off, did a way too many drugs, uh, came, <laughs> came back, got committed for a day, and then a couple of years later started figuring stuff out. And I'm wondering about the dose dependence happening. Oh, yeah, well, that's one of the reasons using ayahuasca is quite tricky because you don't know what's in it. I mean, you can, you, now there are, you know, they do make um, ayahuasca capsules. Uh, but ayahuasca is challenging because you are giving two drugs, you are giving harmony. Harmony in itself is actually not trivial as a, it is a bioactive substance. So it's, you've got that, that complication. But the question is, how do we determine? So when I showed you those DMT pictures, the drawings, that was part of a dose. In all these studies, we've done a dose finding study. And what we do is we dose until we get people to score the experience up to 10, the most intense ever. And then we usually find a dose where we estimate a dose that will give you about eight out of ten, because obviously a bit of variation, and then we, we we use that. And it turns out, and it's been very reliable, that twenty-five milligrams orally of psilocybin is a very reliable. I mean, all around the world, pretty much people are using that dose. With LSD, it's a bit trickier. The LSD was a the LSD study was a fascinating study. I didn't have time to talk much about it, but we gave it intravenously in order to make sure everyone got the same dose because it's slower onset than psilocybin. We do. But amazingly, two people didn't have trips. And uh, even though they got LSD intravenous, and no idea why that is. Um, um, so, yeah, there's, uh, there's, the kinetics of the drugs could play a role. But by and large, it's, it's, we calibrate to produce a big effect, but not an overwhelming effect. Yeah. Sorry, was there anything about... Does it? Um, I know the quick effect is really good. Like, so sort of we find positive effects the day later. Is there anything like you don't see any positive effects and then leave? Nothing changed in the first well, three months. Say about that. Years General, no, no, well, no. We have actually very interesting. We've had one person last week with a who had a, a kind of fifty minute delay before they had a a DMT trip after injecting it and couldn't understand why that was. And I, oh, we've got to measure the levels. But uh, no, um, but the more, much more important point is that the, uh, a lot of people have, t depressed people have tough trips. They don't come out of it thinking, yeah, wow, that was wonderful. They come out thinking, bloody hell, Jesus, was that worth it? Generally thinking, you know, and, and it's the integration. So the, so the benefit, that's why the, I think the benefit was maximum at five weeks. I mean, significantly, it wasn't significantly different from one week to five. But, but I think there are, you know, the, the more people trying to make sense of it and work it through, uh, for some people it's better. So, but it, you know, again, you pretty much you've got a kind of floor effect because I think you know most of it, it comes within the first few hours. But you can I think add to it and probably more likely stabilize it. It's like a therapy. Right. Nice quick one, sorry, and then over to Ed and everyone else. Um, it was just around 
you know, with these substances, the extra pharmacological factors are really important, mm -hmm. which we haven't really talked about, so set and setting and patient expectation. Yeah. Some people have suggested that if you over medicalize these drugs, yeah. then we'll end up with something like Prozac 2.0 because the patient expectations will fit too much into a medical model. <laughs> um, I just, because others have suggested, you know, they're non specific amplifiers of everything around. I just yeah. wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, what well, is a really good point? I mean, this is, you know, very early days in this research. And we don't know how to optimize it. We're, you know, we are, it's one of the reasons we're talking to psychology departments, because that's your job. I mean, my job is to show you how it works and how it's safe. <laughs> your job is to do the psychotherapy side of things. And yeah, you know, it's very likely, I think, that the, 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 there are serious added benefits from, from, from proper preparation and proper, de proper integration afterwards. But I can't say categorically that's true. Yeah, that, we don't even have research on on that, do we? Whether no, we whether, don't. You know what integration don't. even is. Well, we don't no, have, really have any. Question, we don't have any academic research on this anymore, uh, other than it's funded by charities, aren't you? It's uh, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's um, it's the companies that are doing this research. They kind of quite keen not to have a lot of psychotherapy because because yeah, that's yeah. expensive yeah, and well, it's not regulated by it. No, it's, it's um, and. I mean, it's a very interesting time we're at present. You know, there are this conference that Celia and I were at the other day. You know, there are there are people that think you can just blast the brain. You know, maybe ten minutes of five methoxy DMT. Wow, you know, go to another universe, come back cured. Now, I kind of think it's possible, but I sort of feel that you know maybe there's you, know, you might get more if you spend a bit longer in the other place and actually spoke to someone. But anyway, yeah. Thanks for thanks for a really interesting um interesting um presentation. I'm, I'm actually a rumination researcher, so I'm oh. got a kind of few interests in what you're talking about. But um and we we've got some fMRI imagery showing that um, psychological treatments can also affect some of those brain areas as well. So um, maybe not as strong yes. as as the psychedelic effect. How do you stop rumination? Is it mindfulness? So we, we've adapted CBT specifically to target rumination. So one of the things we've, we've recognized is that CBT sometimes, like a lot of treatments, they seem to reduce it temporarily and then it pops back. Um, partly because we think if you've had a long history of depression, the tendency to ruminate is sort of an ingrained habit in the, in the back of the brain and can be triggered by stress, basically. So we, we look at it as a habit and then we help people to, to learn to change the habit over time and, and practice and learning new strategies. And it's interesting, it involves things that include mindfulness and openness and creativity. So it's got some of psychologically coming through some of the same places. So what that made me wonder is one a bit more about the details of what's actually happening in the psychotherapy that you're doing with the psychedelics, but also what that might mean longer term. So I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing is very powerful, relatively short term effects. But what we know with a lot of depression is if you follow people up for two years, folks are getting depressed again so it's, it's really is there something different with psychedelics there or or is it where we is that where we think about the the actual optimal match of medication and yeah. psychotherapy no that's a great great question so um so if you take the first our first trial where we have the longest follow-up data so 20 subjects I might say four are cured eight years later uh, but the rest of the depression comes back because uh, and, and those tend to be the, the more difficult, the, the earlier recurrence tends to be associated with particularly childhood trauma. And, and you can't, you know, you know, if you've been abused or neglected or vilified as a child, you know, you take, your, your whole brain becomes set in a, in, a, in a model where you're a failure. And because as you know, you know, children, you know, essentially the universe in terms of their first construct, so they really, So, you know, that seems to be the big challenge, helping people. And what we might have to do is give them maybe two doses, three doses a year to see maybe we kept it down long enough repeatedly that it would go away, or maybe we need to use other, other approaches. So, you know, I'm, you know, we're very open-minded. I don't know, it might be that when we got people better for the, in the first few weeks, maybe put them on SSRI, it, it, would, um, it would help keep the, the mood down, maybe if we use more creative psychotherapies. The, the psychotherapy we, we, the, our group uses is a kind of acceptance commitment therapy. That's just because that's what they did when they started. And uh, the only thing we can say, and that's, you know, don't um, be too harsh on you, but all, all these patients have failed CBT and they hate CBT. Because that's because there's a lot of bad CBT. Well, I, I, I don't, yes, indeed. And, they, and, and as they say, they go, you know, you have eight weeks of CBT and you end up by the halfway through your, your CBT therapist has 
told you the same thing as the previous yeah. day. Well, we started with CBT and we saw it wasn't working for a bunch of people, so we've started, that's why we've adapted it to target elimination. Yeah, that makes a lot and, more sense. And my prediction from my clinical experience would be, and the research we've done in depression, would be that you, you, you get this very, it sounds like you get this flattening out and the peaks are coming down, the yeah. openness is coming after the psychedelics. So some people, that would be enough. Other people, they'll start to slip back into the, the old patterns yeah. and you might need, like you say, to have maintenance doses, but also maybe longer term psychotherapy to help them learn the new patterns as well. Well, absolutely, yeah. And I, I, so there has been a little bit of work on, uh, on using psychedelics to improve access to, um, to sort of mindfulness and meditation. Uh, and it is quite likely that in that state for a few weeks after the um, the trip when people are in this one, it might that might be a really good time to, to start acquiring new skills in terms of self control. That's a bit what you do with the archipelagos, isn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I would just like to ask. Uh, so, how much do you think, like the from your experience at least, like the long term effects of specific of the substance differ? For example, you say people in psilocybin, like colorblind people who took psilocybin, might uh, perceive color better. Is this something that is also evident in like the T groups? Or you, you understand my question? Yeah, I understand your question perfectly. The answer is we don't know. I mean, I just, we uh, I don't. <laughs> We kind of embarrassed to say, do we still ask people about color blindness? We don't discriminate against color blind people, let's put it that way. I don't know. I'll find out when we've had any other color blind people. Whether, look, there is, uh, there is no evidence that these drugs differ in anything other than kinetics. Now, but that, but that still could be very important. The reason, you know, people perhaps go into this extra universe, special universe with DMT is because it's, the transition is so fast. And fast transitions produce bigger effects than slow transitions. Yeah, I'm asking because if like something like DMT has a very similar long-lasting effect as psilocybin or LSD, for example, it would be easier to implement as a sort of therapy. No? no, that's right. And that's one of the reasons there are companies developing DMT treatment. But a lot of them are saying, hang on, it's a bit too short. So now we're infusing DMT <laughs> to get it to be more like psilocybin. Yeah, the f but then there are still companies that are developing either intranasal or, or, or ling uh, lingual films of 5-methoxy DMT, which is, which is the toad um, uh, sort of, uh, not venom, I suppose, but the toad extract. Um, and that's going to be very short-lived. So it's, the field is very exciting at present. You know, we, you know, in another 10 years, we will have a lot more clarity. Yeah. But those experiments are kind of being done. Thank you. I'm taking the microphone. You said you know where the elves are in the rain, <laughs> the DT elves day, but you said you couldn't divulge it. <laughs> You're not going to divulge that. <laughs> That's the high days. They're the entities. You can tell me where the elves are. <laughs> well, we had David Luke doing a talk for us, and he'd been um, characterizing that, hadn't he? And he found actually clowns were very common, more common than elves. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's. Yeah. Has he seen David Luke's work on DT? It's the and, entities. Yeah, the entities. Your own personal entities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they probably, I mean, they're interesting. They're probably. Kind of, you know, psychological constructs related to yourself. Well, you don't me when you've got a theory, exactly. Yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm not ready to share it yet because haven't, we haven't finished interrogating imaging data yet. Thanks. Um, given the, the mechanisms you're suggesting that it works by, are you not surprised that the outcomes in your trials are unremittingly positive? So thinking about your analogy about the, the valleys in yeah. France and um, Switzerland, if we move that to Papua New Guinea, where you really have got these separate cultures living yeah. in different valleys, you level Papua New Guinea, the tribes all start mixing. There's a very good chance that the tribe next door to you is going to chop off your head and suck your brains out. So in the same way, is there, why are we not getting more instances that when you have leveled the brain, that the new mixing that's coming back has not exposed you to risks in brain regions that have previously become mm -hmm. cut off because of aggression or regression or whatever like that. Well, uh, what yes. is stopping that f the badness flooding out then? Well, I think uh, there are several ways you could answer that question. So, the, the, but I think the first thing is to say that I think there might be circumstances in which it could be problematic, and that's in people with psychosis. The psychosis is a state where there is much less structure to 
brain activity. I mean, the brain is much less modular. There's a lot more, they have a hyper-connected, less differentiated set of networks. So that could make things worse. So that's why we don't. If psychedelics are used with first degree family relatives of, um, of psychosis or first book of personal history of psychosis. So I think it could, it could make things worse. So you might become overconnected. Or the, and it's that, that, that's. the second thing is, I think the reason I don't think you get people have bad trips, but they, they tend mostly people do have benefit. And I suppose that's for two. Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, the, it, perhaps the most interesting question is why do healthy people have benefits? And you, have, you know, that's an interesting psychological question. But depressed people have benefits because you really, you know, they have not been able to, to escape and they can escape. Um, could they escape into something that's even worse? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it would, the only thing that could be worse really would be being psychotic. So and we, I say, we haven't ever seen that. I suppose it's theoretically possible. I don't know if that helps answer your question, but that's the best uh, I can do. I mean, maybe Perry could smoke murky brain. I'm sure that there are more, well, well, as many bad, bad pits as there are good pits that you could open up. And maybe I'm abnormal here, but... Well, no, I think not. You see, I don't know. I, I, I think, and again, you know, I'm interested in the psycho clinical psychologists here. Depression is a fascinating phenomenon because it, it's in everyone, but it's not all, you know, it's, not, it's rarely there. So it, it's, it's kind of hiding. It's a bit like herpes virus, you know, it, it comes out when you're stressed. And, why it should be there at all is really fascinating because I mean, there are people who believe it has some kind of evolutionary value and if you're depressed, you retreat from society so you can heal and that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't know. But it's, it, is, it is kind of paradoxical. Why, why, would, why would we even have that ability? And probably, I suspect it's got something to do with grief. I suspect it, it's, it's about suffering when people die so you don't kill other people because, you know, it's about developing empathy. But I don't know. So I think I think depression is abnormal. You know, it's like pain. You know, you you don't escape from pain into a state where you. I mean, you know, it, I think it's it, these are these are aberrant behaviours which you can reduce as people come back to a normal rather than flip into another aberrant behaviour. Okay, thanks. Hi. Hi. Hello, hello, hi, oh, okay. So, uh, our question goes to the um, color blindness observation, a little bit more complex. So, there is a, a, a spectrum of differences between uh, healthy, normal people in the level of uh, visual thinking and imagination that they have. Uh, so, some people uh, are, you know, not capable of visualizing anything and other people have uh, vivid daydreams etc and then this also translates to um to fantasia yeah exactly but also here. I mean is zeman here all right did he know i was coming actually i read his paper a fantasia last weekend in anticipation so i asked him would psychedelics improve it and he said probably not but he'd think about it and he'd ask them so did well, you know the answer. She can answer your question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> well, uh, I, my question is uh, why ultimately? Why? Why are? They, I'm, I'm not talking only about aphantasia, but the whole spectrum of uh, uh, you know, people's visual thinking that can be more or less, but not. Do you think? So, so if there aren't any improvements, does that mean that the these variations between people come from like maybe genetic differences in the receptor distribution rather than connectivity? Where yeah, it's a very interesting question. From? Yeah, um, well, it's going to be impossible to get grants to study 5-HC2A receptors in a, a fantastic patient, so we're probably never going to know, but it could be, I suppose. Yeah, it's a really, it is, I mean, certainly from the imaging work that Zeman's done, it does suggest that that this, you know, these frontal temporal regions, which have recently evolved, have got something to do with it. Yeah, I, I think you should ask. He's way more expert than me. But, yeah. but he's here. Very, very in frequently here. But there is, yeah, that one paper case giving ayahuasca to aphantasia. Aphantasia is a syndrome where you people can't visualize. Patient, but yeah. You say, you know, think of a 
Think of a pizza. I can see one now. <laughs> so shall we finish or can I ask a question? <laughs> Other questions? Sorry, I'm only teasing her. <laughs> no, no, I can't, can't even miss you. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> what, what struck me from some of the discussion now is what is the role of agency of the patient, if you want to call it that, in this situation? Because a lot of the description now was like it's a train running over somebody and yeah. then they somehow collect themselves. But it, it contradicts what you have been saying earlier in terms of the integration and the psychotherapy, which is, of course, not an individual struggling alone up a high valley to get to the other whatever uh, out of it, but rather it is actually a communicative act with another person or two over a certain time Just one. that establishes a relationship and that gives a very different kind of agency from being stuck either in a depression or on a medication that might or might not have totally flooded your brain. So, so what is the role of agency in this and the sort of mindset in terms of certain setting with which people go into these trials? Because if you go with an intention and then you pick up on this intention, that might actually be yeah. a framing so strong that, you, that explains a lot of the positive effects. Yeah. Well, that's good. Because in depression, a lot of people go into these things with a mindset they're going to fail. Uh, and ha but you're, it's you're really, you know, a lot of in, you know, important questions you raise there. So the first thing is that there is, obviously, we, we only give it to people that volunteer. And, and, you know, people have said to me, well, why don't you um, put them in the scanner and, uh, and stress them and then see what happens? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, so, 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 we're confronted with individuals who, who want to get better. Often they're hostile to previous treatments because they failed. So they do invest an awful lot in, uh, in what we do. And what was actually quite interesting about the escitalopam comparison was that most of those people on escitalopam worked out after the first non-trip that the dose they got was too low. They knew they were in the, were in the escitalopam group. But they stuck with it, and they did pretty well. So... Even, you know, even the nocebo effect of knowing you weren't getting what you wanted. So actually, I said, you know, it's a pretty impressive drug, which reassures me because I've been prescribing it for the last 20 years. So, but, but to what extent... It's from clinical trials that patients get so much more attention than they do under standard protocol treatment that actually they usually do better simply because there's more nurse time, there's more dedication, physician time, etc. So there's, none of this is unusual at all. No, 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 absolutely. No, no, no. The, the diff I mean, the big difference actually is not where they end up, but how fast they get there. Which is, you know, almost instantaneous. Psychedelics and slower as right. But you're right. If you, I mean, there's a brilliant study out of Rhode Island 20 years ago. If you give upfront psychotherapy and an, and an antidepressant straight from the beginning, you know, the outcomes are better than either alone. So absolutely, we just don't do it because we don't value health and mental health as much as we value other kinds of health. I mean, we would do it if it's rehabilitation of a broken leg. We we do, you know, we'd have physio and we'd have. The, the, the um, orthopedic stuff, but with psychiatry, you know, we're, we, we, under, we undervalue mental, the value of mental health. But there is another interesting angle to this, really, which is, uh, you know, what, what are the right attributes? You know, is it, do you want people, why, maybe I'll frame it the other way, why do some, some people not do very well? And we don't know why that is, and it doesn't seem to relate to this, any simple severity measure. So it's got the, it may be that their brains are different, or it may be that, you know, they are, they're not, there's a sense in which some people aren't willing. Our therapists are often worried that people will not let go. That they believe quite powerful, strongly that unless you give in to the experience, you won't get the full experience. If you fight it, and if you fight it, we know, you know, there are tricks people can use not to have a trip. You spend a lot of time with your eyes open and you're kind of thinking about things and trying, trying to overcome the effect. You can, in some cases, not have a trip. So, so uh, there, there may be individuals who kind of who are scared of it. And anxiety is an issue. It was a negative predictor in the first trial. Being worried about losing your mind. We're finding this a big problem now. We've got an OCD trial setting up, but our patient experts said we will not have a trip. There was no way. They said absolutely not. Forget it. 
he expects us to have a trip and lose control, we're not going into the study. So now we're doing a different kind of study. We're doing what's called a midi dose study. We're going to give them, give them 10 milligrams of psilocybin before they do the psychotherapy, before they do the exposure therapy, to see if, if we can loosen up the brain enough for them to get more benefit from it. And then hopefully, if they then get confident in the next stage, they could have a full trip. So there's there are, there are a lot of psychological variables which we you know we need to address for having kids. So firstly, thank you very much for speaking to us. Um, you've obviously done wonderful work, spotlight transformative potential of these substances. Um, what I'm wondering about is, my understanding is that the narratives, the societal narratives for the substances have, during this psychedelic renaissance era, been overwhelmingly positive, and I feel for good reason, we had to fight against what the previous narratives of the war on drugs, and we had to highlight that these substances have yeah. benefit to offer, and they have something unique to offer as well. But I am wondering, especially noticing the backlash that is coming recently, and I think the, the zeitgeist, I guess, of the understanding of psychedelics is kind of sifting, especially through social media. A lot of people are pushing back against these evangelical narratives about psychedelics, and I think you need to be acknowledging more their, both their intrapersonal, so things like hallucinatory persistent perception disorder, mm -hmm. persisting dissociation. A lot of people have quite bad dreams that they don't recover from, but also their interpersonal ones, like the power trip podcast that I'm sure you're aware of, all things coming into the surface, because it's not just therapy that people are getting abused at. I think we need to acknowledge that this state of mind is a malleable state of mind, and it is a state of mind that yeah. is ideal for someone that wants to take advantage of something. Yeah. So how do you think we can go forward in order to have some balance to acknowledge both sides, to not say, oh, psychedelics are good or bad? How can we find nuance, especially at an age of like Twitter death of nuance, I guess? Yeah. So. Um... Well, there are, obviously, we spend a lot of time thinking about those things. Um, can you hear me? Sorry. So the first thing to say is there aren't lots of bad effects. I mean, so we've done 200 healthy volunteers, uh, 80 patients. We've had no enduring bad effects. So they're not that common. So, you know, you have to... In fact, when you look at historically the use of these drugs, we just published a paper a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at the, the whole history of adverse effects of psychedelics, it's pretty hard to find much in the way of reliable, reliable data on negative side effects. And the ones that were, were either created fictitious or were elaborated by the, by the war on drugs people. So, so the hysteria about these drugs is, um, is way, and the hype, or the hype of harm is much exaggerated. That's the first thing to say. Second thing to say about uh, um, HPPD, the uh, hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder, is that there is no evidence that it harmed anyone. I mean, I get an email a month from someone saying, is my brain damaged by taking psychedelics because I get flickering lights inside of my, my vision? And I say, well, I, you know, so why? But that doesn't mean my brain's damaged or my eyes are damaged. It's just, you know, that's, it's just a bit different. So a lot of the, 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 the 50 years of disinformation about these drugs has created a lot of uh, fear in people's minds. That's the second thing. The third thing is, you, can you change people's minds? Under well, well, actually, the good thing about the, there's one thing that we know from NK Ultra, which is the CIA's attempt to brainwash people under psychedelics, is you can't. It doesn't work. So we don't need to worry about that. We're not going to turn people into different people. We're not going to make them robots or automatons or killers under psychedelics. They're not that strong. You know, I mean, nationalism is a much more powerful motivator than psychedelics. So, so, so that's that. And, um, or even just conformity, you know, I mean, uh, and then what about, are people vulnerable to, to misuse by therapists? Well, yeah, yeah. you know, I've written about this, we know therapy abuse is actually is rife, absolutely rife, particularly in, uh, in in therapies which aren't controlled. So the way you deal with any of those issues is you have you have trained therapists who are monitored. We film everything. 
Uh, so even if people do believe or get, get a sense that something was wrong during the interview, you can show them and reassure them that it's... So I think overall, this, the fears are exaggerated, but I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that the, the biggest issue for us at present is um, possibility of false memories. So I don't know if you, did any of you see, we've made, made two documentaries on our work. The recent one was called The Psychedelic Dog Trial on BBC Two. But the first one was called Magic Medicine, Hash Magic Medicine, that's just come out on Netflix. And there was one of, the, one of our subjects there, um, who had a false memory of being smothered by his father um, when he was young. And now he, it was a false memory and he knew it was a false memory, but he, it still was there in his mind. So yeah, that's sort of, the, and we, had, he, we had, had to engage with quite a bit of, uh, of therapy to, to help him make sense of that because he was, it was concerning him. So that is, that is an issue. Right? And we are thinking quite hard about how we might make sure, you know, how we deal with those, you know, those kind of statements. Now, they're not unique to psychedelics. I had a patient with severe OCD 30 years ago who, who, was, um, who went into hospital for OCD. And one of the nurses said, well, quite often people, look with your problems, have been abused by their fathers. And she had the thought, like a primary hallucination, delusion, I've been abused. Oh. And she couldn't get that thought out of her mind because she was, she was obsessive and she could never spend any time with her father again. So. You know, people are suggestible. It may be a bit more suggestible than psychedelics, but there's nothing unique to psychedelics in terms of of, of, need, of requiring any more, you know, you need professional approach, whether you're, you're dealing with people psychedelics or dealing with people that. Well, we also need to enhance the increase of the disability. That's how we can do But we don't, I don't know. I, I actually don't know if you're right. So we've looked at suggestibility. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not as if you can take someone who's not suggestible and turn them into believing, you know, anything i mean there's a you can edge suggestibility can be edged a bit but it, it's not i mean people don't you know, I mean, generally I don't, well i don't actually think you're right i don't think people can be hyper suggestible but we're talking about hyperplasticity right so that has to the brain function has to correlate to the mind function as well so it does make sense that people are more suggestible malleable no i don't agree with you i don't agree at all look at depression the nature of recurrent thinking in depression is an internal suggestion, which is wrong. Nothing to do with psychedelics. People get locked. Suggestibility exists. I don't. I mean, psychedelics might even break down suggestibility. I, I, I just. I don't think you're right. What about increased inclusion of other in self, which is a measure that has been used, and we do know that people feel more linked. That the boundaries are blurred. So if you feel like you're more connected to the other person, are you not more influenced? Okay. I, use my here as well. I understand you, but I don't see being more connected with other people as a problem. I see that as a solution. Well, it's neither, but it is something. <laughs> yeah. That's a very nice question it, in the chat. One of the reasons people get better and stay better. It's like, it's like saying you can see better because you've got glasses. You know, I mean, yeah, it, uh, just a check, you know, the implication that you change something and that necessarily bad seems to me bizarre. I don't know why you're making it. Yeah. Hi, so uh, I just have a quick question um, based on the uh, 2017 COP Paris paper, um, which showed the large reduction in depressive thoughts and the um, I'd say the closest thing that we have to uh, license uh, Bravato SK. Um, do you know roughly how it compares to that? So ketamine is very interesting because it. It obviously, as I showed you, it has a very similar cortical uh, signature to serotonergic psychedelics. It's a rapidly acting mood elevator with the ketamine and the anesthetic ketamine, and it's been used uh, and it's now developed as an intranasal spray called esketamine. It's about it. Well, it's, it has some advantages over psych uh, serotonergic psychedelics. It seems to work in even if you're on an SSRI, whereas SSRIs tend to blunt the effects of, um, of serotonergic psychedelics. But the effect is much less long acting. So most studies with ketamine show the antidepressant effect wears off within a, within a few days. So normally it's given twice a week for a few weeks and then gradually the antidepressant effect builds up. But they, both ketamine and, and the serotonergic psychedelics do have a, this neuroplasticity effect. So they're similar in that regard as well. They can promote neuroplasticity and potentially the laying down of new thought processes. Um, but they obviously, subjectively, they're not the same experience. Um, again, we don't really, we don't know exactly why that is. Maybe, I don't, I don't, 
Well, I think that's different. Um, just if just in the way the trials are done, because most of the ketamine literature has given the drug alone, whereas psilocybin, your, your New England Journal paper, that were like 40 hours of therapy, is that right? I mean, there's a lot of therapy yeah. alongside yeah. it. So yeah. actually, yeah. in my trial, a <laughs> little plug for it, mm -hmm. we showed effects on drinking and, and on depression at three months yeah. because we combined it with therapy. So I think it just shows the value of psychological therapy. Um, yeah. I would say that. Uh, Alex, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah I think it's probably quite a good follow-up question actually As, um so classic psychedelics are predominantly serotonin acting ketamine is nmda acting um, there's probably other psychopastogens that are classical psychedelics that have other mechanisms um, and at the same time the disorders we're trying them for are all thought to have relatively different neurobiological pathologies in a sense um so what is why is it that why is there this general idea this general um finding that regardless of how the psychedelic works and regardless of what sort of you throw it at, it seems to work. Is it all about synaptic plasticity or is there some better explanation? I think it's about disruption. I think the plasticity is useful afterwards, probably not necessarily useful. Um, I think, okay. One of the th remarkable things that the patients say, if you read that um, narrative paper, the virus, is even the, 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 you know, phenomena that actually experience of not being in that depressive mindset, even for a few hours from the trip, can, it shows that they can escape and give them both into their you know, belief that they, or knowledge that they can change. So I think there's a powerful psychological aspect to that. It may not be quite the same as the effect. And the plasticity, you know, may well be useful. So the big question at present, and this is a huge issue, so the US Department of Defense the U.S. Department of Defense has just given $29 million to a guy, a guy called Brian Roth in North Carolina to make a non-psychedelic psychedelic, which is a bit of an oxymoron. But um, they believe that they can make plastogens, they can make serotonergic plastogens, plasticity enhancers, that are going to lift PTSD and depression without being psychedelic. Why do they want to do that? because I don't know why I want to do that, because they've got more money than sense. But anyway, they, it is about people are still scared of the idea of psychedelics. Now, I don't think, I think a plastogen might be useful. I think if you, maybe you took it you know, every day like Prozac, it might work, and it probably would work like Prozac in some way. So, but it's unlikely to be as revolutionary, I think, as, uh, as these dissociative ones that disrupt circuits. So do you think the, the experience is quite important? I mean, we had, a, we, did, we had a discussed an idea with um David and someone to about doing one of these trials but after sedating people so if you knock them out yeah. on profile and then give them some yeah. idea or get to it yeah. can you see anything we haven't got it funded obviously well no I said mean, yeah well no there are people have said well you I don't believe any of this it's all this is all just massive placebo effect people know they've had a trip and therefore they get better and I say two things I say well yeah but often the trips are challenging and difficult and distressing and you know so it's not it's not fun uh and um and then they say, well, the only way to prove it's not placebo is to give it under anesthesia. And I think, well, that's kind of a bit odd. There's no other treatment in medicine you want to give under anesthesia just so to prove that people aren't wanting to get better. I mean, what's wrong with wanting to get better? Isn't that kind of what we're trying to do? We're trying to get people... Guys. So there's this, again, again, there's this peculiar malignant sort of hostility to the concept of doing something with a psychedelic, which is different. And, I, don't know, I guess it will change in time when people get more reassured. But it's it's, it's interesting. To, you know, it would be quite interesting to know if the neuro. We've got measures of neuroplasticity now. Sorry, you know, maybe would they would they be impaired by a be, having the drug given under um, propofol? They might well be. What would that tell us? That they're important potentially, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, I suppose it, the other side would be interesting. If you still got the benefit, then perhaps. By being well, whilst you're unconscious, then perhaps you went, remove some element of risk from the treatment. If you're on the chest, but... uh, hang on. The idea that these drugs are, are more risky than anesthesia that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that really is wrong. Wild <laughs> sedation. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe not. But, I mean, <laughs> one of them is an anesthesia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apart from ketamine, they're, they're definitely safer than other anesthesia. <laughs> uh, um. Okay, I think obviously we've gone way for the overtime. Um, so, 
Uh, there's a question on the chat. Do you, I want to ask that, M Michelle, MCL? <laughs> I don't know if that's how you say your name. Oh, no, there's two questions. So one, do you think psychedelics, should I ask that or Alex Jones? Oh, I'll just ask it. Do you think psychedelics would, should ever become available, available legally over the counter as opposed to prescribed? So I guess without a prescription. Well, they are in places like um, Holland and Oregon and Oakland and Denver and Ann Arbor. So yeah, I mean, of course they should be. I mean, you know, they're, they're less harmful than alcohol. Anything less harmful than alcohol should be available in some kind of regulated market. No. Not for patients. I mean, you know, not for self-medication, but for self-exploration. And are you founding a research on Stan Groff's research from the 50s and 70s? Are these historical findings any help to your research? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The historical findings are, are, are amazing for all sorts of reasons. The first is they could give us this enormous data set of thousands and thousands of patients with levels of harm and, uh, and consequences, which are really very reassuring. And um, yeah, they also tell us a lesson there. They also, why, why did psychedelics get banned? Well, the, the common, the simple story is the, is the Vietnam War, and they were associated with the anti-Vietnam War movement. And, in those days, governments couldn't ban protests against war, but they could ban drugs. Just be careful, in this country, we will very soon ban protests. You know that. I mean, you know, this new Civil Disobedience Act is going to ban protests. But so we're actually in a worse situation than we were in the 60s. But it was more than that. The other reason it got banned was because the pharmaceutical industry had discovered antidepressants. And there were competition. And the pharmaceutical industry had was doing trials, the beginnings of the modern RCT, and uh, and they convinced the regulators that was the only way, the only evidence that was valid. So it was easy for doctors who were supporting the pharma industry, and I can say this as a doctor who's even worked for the pharma industry, it was, it was easy for them to say, we can't trust the data from the psychedelics because it wasn't done in the, the way we're doing it now. So it was seen as not having the right evidential base. And, we see that today with medical cannabis. People say, well, we have, you haven't done it the right way, therefore it, it has no value, ignoring all the other kinds of evidence that were there. So um, the hist history is actually very helpful. It actually was very helpful to us when we got permission to do our first study, um, the very, very first study at all in humans. We went to MHRA and said, we want to do this um, uh, experiment. And they said, well, show us the safety data. And we said, well, you know, it wasn't medicine in 1958, Sandra made it a medicine, we haven't got that data. However, we said, we also know it's been, you know, magic mushrooms have been around, used in Britain for 20 odd years, million people a year, no deaths. And they said, oh, that's all right, then that sounds reasonable. And, uh, and that's why they, and, you know, they let us do it. So the historical evidence is actually very reassuring. Heartening to hear from the MHRA. Um, well, I just wanted, if we can all thank Dave again for his amazing talk. <laughs> We do have some uh, sentia <laughs> provided by the Department for Psychology, which is Dave's non-alcoholic alcoholic drink. <laughs> so uh, we'll get that out. Um, what, we, we don't get to know what the active ingredients are. <laughs> yeah, no, they're on the package. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I know Joe had a question around them. But yeah, we'll get some of that out and help yourselves. And Absolutely. do help yourselves to the quite cold pizza now. Um, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Bye, Peter. So you can be here. Bye. Thank Peter. you, David. See you soon. Good. Yeah.